see everyone this morning in the house of God. We want to say welcome to each and every one of you. Thank you for being here this morning. Let's open our services by going to God in prayer and asking his blessing on our time together. Would you bow with me this morning as we seek the Lord's face? Father in heaven, we are so thankful this morning for a wonderful opportunity to be in your house. And we ask this morning that you would make it known in our minds and fresh in our minds that not every, everyone in the world shares this great privilege. Father, help us to be grateful and count it as a great blessing to be here this morning. We pray this morning that as we worship you, we lift up our voices, that it would be a sound of joy into your ear and a sound of blessing. Father, we pray that our hearts would be strengthened and encouraged by all that is done and seen and heard here today. Most of all, Father, we pray for the reading of your word here in just a few moments. And for our pastor as he stands before us. And Father, we pray that you would make your word the centerpiece of this, of this great day. And that everything that we do today centers around your word. And as he stands to speak, may you bless him, give him the strength and the wisdom and the clarity of thought that he needs to share with us from your holy word. And we pray for your spirit to come and touch our hearts and to move us and help us to yield to you in your perfect will. May you bless each one here today and watch over us in the week to come. Keep us safe, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. It is good to see everyone. If you are visiting with us today for the first time to you, we want to say a special welcome and thank you for being with us. Uh, we're always honored when we have new guests with us to worship and to serve God with us. We're so thankful to have you. If you are visiting for the first time, you should have gotten a connection card in your Sunday program that you could fill out. If you would fill that out and give it back to us in the offering plate or when you leave today, we would greatly appreciate that. We want to have record of your visit. And we want to get to better know you so we can better minister to your needs uh, and your family, whatever needs you might have. Uh, today's a little bit of a special day. We're going to honor our graduates today. Uh, I only see a few of them here. We have five all together from our church that are graduating from high school this year. And we'd like to take a few moments to recognize them. We have some gifts for them. We'd like them to come up on the stage, do a song and dance, you know. Maybe tell us a little bit about themselves, what their plans are. If they wish to speak, they certainly may. Uh, but I'd like to take a few moments. Where did uh, Emily go? There she is right there. Emily Self, would you come up here for a moment, Emily? Emily is one of our graduates. Emily has been a member of our church for a very long time. She is a homeschool education. Young lady, I marked this with blue because it's yours. It's special. It's special. She, she is our only girl graduating this year, and so we appreciate her. Uh, she loves, she's a very outgoing, very gregarious person, loves to talk. <laughs> she probably has a lot of things she'd like to share with you. Is there anything you'd like to share with them about your future? <laughs> she, I'm, I'm surprised that we got her on the stage, honestly. <laughs> Thought I had to melt her down and pour her up. You stay right here just a second. I believe there's one more here. Paul Day, he is one of our graduates, also a homeschool education young man. I went to his graduation yesterday just because I didn't believe it. I had to go see it for myself. Uh, Paul's an outstanding young man. Uh, has been His family has been a cornerstone in this church a long time. He's uh, been a, His whole family, even including Paul, have been great laborers in our church, always serving the Lord. Paul serves back in the sound booth. This gift is for you from our church. We appreciate you very much. Is Seth Calvert here? Seth's not here. Seth, and then we got Dustin Dunkel is not here. Casey Morrow, is he here? Okay. Well, those are our other threes. Would you give our graduates a round of applause, please? Thank you. Thank you, Paul said he would reserve his comments for a later time. He's a man of a few words. We're very proud of them. Tonight we're going to have a, a banquet after church to honor our, bank, our graduates. We're going to have some cake and some punch, and we invite you to come back and, and celebrate that with them. And so if you can, be here at 6 o'clock tonight for our service. I'm going to preach to those young people about having a, a legacy of leadership and how we're going to pass the torch of leadership on to them someday. 
and then we're going to have a small banquet to recognize and honor them. So please be here for that. I do have one more thing. Apparently, a lot of people got married late May. Uh, there's several uh, anniversaries, is my understanding. This is now you want to do this? Okay. Uh, let me get this straight. The McCulloughs are celebrating an anniversary. Uh, also, the Woodwards. And who was the other one? So, who was the other one, Brother West? Speak now or forever old. The Pratt's. Yeah, there you go. All right. All right we're going to sing happy anniversary to them because I like to do that. You guys ready? Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary. God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. Amen. I know all three of those men, and that is a great testimony to the long-suffering and patience of their wives. May God bless you and many more years to come. I want to offer a little bit of a disclaimer this morning. You may notice uh, from Sunday to Sunday that uh, sometimes I and, and the choir are singing from a different colored hymnal that you all are singing from. We sing out of the celebration hymnal, and there's a purpose behind that because it's orchestrated for our other instruments, and the tan hymnal, the In Spirit and Truth, is not. Both of them are wonderful resources, and we utilize both. The disclaimer I want to offer to you is that a lot of times uh, I, I hopefully will give you and you'll see the right numbers presented up here. Uh, the verses sometimes will have a word or two and some that will be differ, differing from one hymnal to another. And in some rare cases, there are verses that are in different order than one. So if we get in a situation where we're singing something and you're kind of looking at me like, well, which planet did you come from? This is not in our hymnal or this is the third verse and you're singing it as the first verse. That's why we're working to correct those errors uh, that, that uh, are occurred. There are hymns that I'm calling crossover hymn, hymns. In other words, they're in both hymnals, but they may just be a different number and different order as far as the stanzas. So I, I pray, beg for your understanding as we work through that. We'll get it resolved one of these days where we'll either all be on the same page or, uh, or we'll do something different. So uh, please understand as we sing. Hymn number 133, for you, glory to his name. Let's stand together. Our instruments are going to play through this one time to give you an opportunity to fellowship and greet our visitors, and then we'll begin singing. So instruments.
You may be seated. Number 395, Heaven Came Down.
Offertory Hymn is Since I Have Been Redeemed, number 382. Let's stand together as we sing. I have a song I love to sing since I have been prepared to take up our morning offering and go to God in prayer again. I, I do want to mention one thing that I overlooked. We do have a college graduate among us as well, too. Sister Kelly Day is graduated. Is that right? Aren't you graduating from college? Yes, yes. Did you? Did you? <laughs> she said what? <laughs> Congratulations. I'm going to give her one of these gifts. Hey, come here. I'm going to give you a gift. Can I give you a gift? That's my spiritual gift. She's going to be. Any yeah, are there any other college graduates this year that we don't know of? She is going to be educating the future of America, right? You're going to be a school teacher, molding new minds. That's, that's good. We're happy for her and all of our high school graduates as well. As we prepare to take up this offering, we want to go to God in prayer and ask His blessings on it <clears throat> and ask His blessings on the many uh, prayer requests that we do have on our list. I do want to mention one very quickly, uh, not to be selfish, but uh, I know that we have a lot of burdens. We could spend probably hours going through the burdens and the needs, but I want to ask specifically that you would pray for my father. They did confirm this week that he has Lou Gehrig's disease, and he didn't preach at all last Sunday on Mother's Day, which is rare, especially a, a special day like that. I called him yesterday. He's uh, going to try to preach today. If you don't know, my father's a pastor in Stillwater of a mission there. And so pray for him. Pray for his church in the future. Uh, we don't know what the future holds for him. Well, we know what the future holds for all of us, but for the church, we don't know. But pray for them and, uh, and what's happening there. Are there any unspoken prayer requests you'd like to make known by raising your hand? Maybe a special burden. Seeing all of these, let's go to God in prayer <clears throat> and ask his blessing on this offering. Brother Andy Joe, would you lead us in prayer, please? Amen. We thank you so much for all of your grace and your love. And uh, we just pray that you'll be with all those that are sick and injured here, Lord. We pray that you'll be with our sister churches that are, are needing help right now here, Lord. We just pray that you'll, you'll be with them. And yes.
Amen. Amen. We're going to do um, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Um, this is a song that I always sing to my kids 20 times a day because if there's anything I ever want to be in the back of their minds is that I always told them to turn their eyes upon Jesus and it'll make everything better. So. Oh, so are you trouble no light in the darkness you see there's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free Turn
Amen. That's good advice. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. We need to keep our focus on Him no matter what we may be going through. I want you to turn your eyes upon Deuteronomy chapter 5 right now. Deuteronomy chapter 5. We're in a study on the Ten Commandments. We're looking at these commandments as commandments, as God said, that we ought to teach in our homes. We need to teach these to our children, teach them to our grandchildren. And we've been looking at them, and I've been trying to share with you some of the ways that maybe we can do this, uh, how we can use this in the home to instruct and train our children. The next generation needs to know the law of God and obey it. Today we're going to look at verse 17, the shortest of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill. That's one everybody thinks they've kept. I've not broken that one. Well, the time we get through with this, you may wonder if you've kept this or not. Thou shalt not kill. Now, I said that there's a positive to every negative. Now, there's the negative, thou shalt not kill. What would be the positive? How about the sanctity of life? We ought to look upon life as a gift from God. God is the author of life. And as the author, the creator of life, then he gets to set the rules, doesn't he? By how we should live life. And God established a sanctity of life. He even said that he who sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. Who was the first murderer? What was his name? Cain. Didn't, didn't last long, did it? The, Children of Adam and Eve, one son rose up and slew his brother, Abel. And God gave this command, capital punishment. Now some say, well, thou shalt not kill. That means we should not be executing criminals. No, God said that that is not part of this commandment. We are allowed to execute murderers and practice capital punishment. Thou shalt not kill. The Hebrew word kill there is murder. Thou shalt not do murder. Now there are times in war it's necessary to kill. There are times in self-defense it's necessary to kill. Capital punishment necessary to kill. But what this is prohibiting is the murder of one person taking the life of another when it's not involving war or self-defense. 
So to try to take this and apply it to killing anything, I, mean, I read about some people breaking into a laboratory and setting the experimental mice, the mice they were using in lab tests, setting them free and they justified it saying, well, the Bible says thou shalt not kill. Well, that's going to the extreme on this. This is a prohibition against the willful taking of human life. Jesus is the great life giver. Satan is the great life taker. And Jesus said of the devil in John 10, 10, he said the thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. And Jesus said, I am come that you might have life, that you might have it more abundantly. Our lesson in Sunday school, if you're using it accordingly, was about choose life. And it goes right along with our message today. God is saying choose life. God is the giver of life. And here's the first point, how we can choose life. How we can choose life. There are three areas we can think about here. First of all, God gives us physical life. Now everybody here, you receive the gift of life. According to Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Now thank God today for your physical life. That's a gift from God. God gives you the breath of life. God gives you every breath of life. That next breath of life is a gift from God. And God can stop it anytime he wants to. Amen? So he's the giver of physical life. He is the creator of life. Now don't we need to teach our children this? God is the creator of life. What's the world trying to teach them? They're being taught this monkey mythology of evolution that really doesn't explain anything. To say that life came about through spontaneous generation in some primordial soup, folks, that's laughable. Especially since evolution cannot give account for the origin of the soup. Where did that come from? They can't tell, they can't explain the origin of life, but the Bible does. God is the creator of life. I want to share with you a a quote from Dr. George Wald, W-A-L-D. He was a Nobel Prize winner in science and an evolutionist. I want you to hear what he says. This is his own testimony. He said, quote, when it comes to the origin of life on this earth, there are only two possibilities, creation or spontaneous generation. There is no third way. Spontaneous generation, now listen to this, this is an evolutionist. He said spontaneous generation was disproved a hundred years ago. But that leads us only to one other conclusion, that of supernatural creation. We cannot accept that. The conclusion that life arose as a supernatural creative act of God, we cannot accept that on philosophical grounds. Therefore, we choose to believe the impossible that life arose spontaneously by chance. End of quote. Can you imagine that? He said it's been disproved. It's really impossible. But we would rather believe this than believe in God. Nobel Prize winner in science. And that tells you this is not a science. It's a religion. Evolution is a religion. You believe it by faith because there's no evidence to back it up. Matter of fact, as he said, it was disproved 100 years ago. 
It is a bias against Almighty God. And yet, it is the dominant theory of origins being taught at our schools today. We better teach our children something else. In the church and in the homes, we need to teach them God is the giver of life. And don't be deceived by the mythology of today. Now, not only does God give physical life, number two, God gives spiritual life. Now, all of you have physical life. Maybe not all of you have spiritual life. Spiritual life only comes when you're born again. When you're born again into the family of God, you are then given a new life. You're given spiritual life. Those who are lost, the Bible says, they are dead in trespasses and sin. They are spiritually dead. And through faith in Jesus Christ, you're born again and regenerated and given spiritual life. Look over in John chapter 3 and notice what Jesus says about this in talking with Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a very good man, a, a Bible teacher, one that people looked up to, a leading citizen, but he was not born again. And Jesus said to him in John 3, 3, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus, this great Bible scholar, didn't understand that. He said, how can that be? And he says in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that's physical life, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit, that is spiritual life. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born. Again, he didn't say you ought to be or you should be. You must be. If you're not born again, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. You will not see or know or experience spiritual life. It is a regeneration. Do you have this life? A child of God is a spiritual creature. Folks, a Christian is not just somebody who's getting better, who's trying to do his best and reform himself. He's not like a tadpole becoming a frog. Hey, he's more like a frog becoming a prince. Amen. You're born into the royal family of God. And it's a new beginning. I mean, we deal with some people, they kind of act like getting saved is the end of the journey. No, it's the beginning of the journey. You've got a new life. Old things are passed away and behold, all things become new. A new life in Jesus Christ. Born again Christians have been born again. They're not just nice people trying to do their best. They're not just people that have accepted some doctrinal creed or, or some code of conduct. No, you are a new creature in Christ. Supernaturally regenerated and transformed by the power of the gospel. Do you have spiritual life? Have you been born again? That leads to the third thing. God gives eternal life. Eternal life. Eternal life is the consequences of having a spiritual life. Along with spiritual life comes this everlasting life. Jesus said this to those who trust in him. This is from John 10, 27. He said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Neither shall any pluck them out of my hand. Who gives eternal life? The Lord Jesus. He's the only one that can. There is no other way by which you can go to heaven and have this eternal life. Do you have that? 
Do you know, do you have assurance that if you die today, that you're going to heaven and you've got life everlasting? Reminds me of the little boy who was in a pet store. He was wanting to buy a little puppy. And he's looking at all the little puppies and he noticed one kind of sitting off in the corner wagging his tail. And he pointed to that one and he said, I want that one over there with the happy ending. I tell you what, my friend, I've chosen Jesus Christ. I'm going to have a happy ending. Aren't you? That's already been settled. He that believes in Christ has everlasting life. We need to teach our children to choose life. And you choose life by choosing Jesus Christ. Lead them to know the Lord as their Savior. Protect them from the enemy. Protect them from that murderer, Satan. He wants to destroy them. Listen to me. The devil wants to destroy your children. The devil wants to destroy your grandchildren. And if you got them, your great-grandchildren. He is a destroyer. He is the taker of life. And we've got to protect our children from him and from the dark forces of this world that seek to destroy them. Teach them to choose life. Teach them to choose Jesus Christ. Trust in Him as their Lord and Savior. We saw that if you're in Sunday school this morning, Deuteronomy chapter 30. I don't have time to read it. Just make a note in your, uh, in your notes. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Verses 15 through 20. It talks about, he's telling Israel, I set before you good and bad, blessing and cursing, life and death. And he says, choose life. Choose life. Why would anybody choose death? Would anybody consciously choose death? But by rejecting Christ, you're choosing death. By rejecting the word of God, by rejecting the way God has ordained for us to come to him, we choose death and destruction. Hey, don't assume your grandchildren, don't assume the kids in your family, we'll bring in nieces, nephews, and everybody else. Anybody you've got influence on in your family, don't assume that they know what we're talking about here. If I were you, I'd take time to sit down with them and make sure that they understand that God is giving them a choice. And they should choose life. And show them how they can do that. It would be the greatest gift you can give any young person in your family. Choose life. Choose life. Now secondly, not only do we need to understand how to choose life, but how we must not cancel life. The idea thou shalt not kill. That involves three areas that we can look at. First of all, thou shalt not commit homicide. Thou shalt not commit homicide or murder. Now, there are three ways we can do this. First of all, there is intentional murder. Somebody intentionally taking the life of another human being. And life that is sacred and life that nobody has the right to take except God himself. Now listen, God is the giver of life, and God is the only one to decide when that life should end. You don't have that right to cancel out the life of another human being. Now again, in times of self-defense or war, that is set aside. And the Bible says this. But are we not living in a bloody, murderous society today? I mean, you read about people will kill somebody just for their shoes. That's what life means to them. They can quickly and without thought take a person's life just for a few dollars. We're living in a culture that does not uphold sanctity of life anymore. We've got to teach our children this, do we not? 
Now, the murderer may escape the justice of man, but he'll not escape the justice of God. God will see to that. But not only is there intentional murder, there is indirect murder. And there's two ways we can be guilty of this. We can be guilty of this by cruelty. You know, some people kill other people by degrees. It's not immediate. It's a slow death. The way they treat these people, they can shorten the life of another person. I think sometimes children shorten the lives of their parents. I didn't mean that to be funny. I think they can so break the hearts of mom and dad and bring them so much burden and grief, they can actually shorten the life of another. You know what I'm talking about. By cruelty. By the way we treat people. We can send them to an early grave. But not only by cruelty, but by corruption we can do this. I don't think any Christian ought to be involved in a business that is killing or shortening the lives of people. Come on. I would not be involved in any business. I would not be involved in the liquor industry. Amen. I wouldn't sell it. I wouldn't help make it. I would not serve it. If my job at a restaurant required serving strong drink to my neighbor, I'd have to go find another job. Because the Bible says don't do that. Woe unto him that serveth his neighbor strong drink. Woe means a curse. I don't think any Christian ought to be involved in the liquor industry. I don't think any Christian ought to be involved in the tobacco industry because that is killing multitude of people slowly. Matter of fact, I don't think you ought to be involved in the pornography industry or in the gambling industry. I'm talking about things that the devil uses to destroy lives. And we have no business being involved in anything like that, anything that's responsible for the deaths of others. There's other jobs out there. Go find one. You don't need to do that. I don't really see how you can expect God to bless you and your family if you're involved in any of these industries. And then there's thirdly, invisible murder. Invisible murder. What I mean by that is what Jesus said in Matthew 15, 19, for out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts and murders. 1 John 3, 15, whosoever hates his brother is a murderer. That's invisible murder. You ever, you ever just got so angry you wanted to kill somebody? You ever thought about, you know, how you could kill somebody and get away with it? Come on. You ever gotten that angry, that bitter, that you actually entertain such thoughts in your own mind? So that's invisible murder. But you know what? God judges that. The thoughts and intents of your heart. See, the visible act of murder begins with the invisible thought of murder. Amen? You think it before you do it. But if you think it, God holds you even responsible for your thoughts. I tell you what, just, just drive down the BA Expressway during rush hour and see the murder in many people's eyes. They want to kill you. You cut them off. Now we understand that thou shalt not commit homicide. Secondly, thou shalt not commit suicide. Thou shalt not commit suicide. You're not allowed to take your own life. Again, God gave you life and it's God who'll decide when that life should end. It's wrong. 
It's just as wrong to take your own life as it is to take another man's life. Amen. Today there's an estimated 5,000 young people committing suicide per year in America. So do we need to teach our children some things about this? If we got 5,000 children taking their own lives each year, moms, dads, that we need to be teaching something about life, choose life. I don't care how bad things may be, choose life. Let God work these things out. Doesn't matter how depressed you are, how despondent you become, choose life. Turn that life over to God and prayerfully let him work these things out. See, you're letting the devil come in when you choose death. When you choose to take your own life, you're not listening to God, you're listening to the devil. That's exactly what the devil wants you to do. The devil wants to destroy your life and the life of others. Now, people ask, well, can a true Christian ever be guilty of committing suicide? Some think suicide is the unpardonable sin, and it's not. Suicide is a sin. It would be a sin to take your own life. But I, now this is just some Westology here. I believe that a saved person can get so despondent that they'll take their life. They'll go to heaven if they're saved. It's not the unpardonable sin. No more unpardonable sin than if you took somebody else's life. David took the life of Uriah. David's in heaven. He sinned. But it's not unpardonable sin. The only unpardonable sin in the Bible is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Rejecting the testimony of the Holy Spirit and remaining in unbelief. So yes, it's possible. But it's very sad for a child of God to ever get to that place, to become so emotionally unbalanced that they would do such a thing. But we need to remember, no matter how severe the ordeal that you may be going through, that your children may be going through, God is there and God will supply a way through it. Look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. You need to remind yourself of this when you're going through difficult times. Here it says, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, but God's faithful. And God will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. See that? But he will with the temptation make a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. Now, when you're going through some hard times, claim that verse. Go to God in prayer and say, God, you said you would not put anything on me that I could not bear. Lord, I'm asking you today to help me bear this burden. Help me endure it. Help me overcome it. Don't you think God would honor that kind of praying? I believe he would. Go to God in prayer during your darkest hours and see if he'll not make a way of escape. Now we can cut our life suddenly, as many do. They'll do something to end their life immediately. I would tell you something else. We can also cut our life slowly. Now I mentioned being in a business that does that. But if you go buy their alcohol and you go buy their tobacco and you get involved in these things, then you are responsible for cutting your own life Short, slowly. Why in the world would anybody smoke with all the evidence around us of what it does to your body? Why would anybody ignore what the use of tobacco will do and foolishly and blindly go on sucking themselves to death? Suck, suck, suck at cigarettes. Suck, suck, suck until you suck yourself to death. Is that foolish? For a child of God 
to just ignore what the Bible says about the body being the temple of the Holy Spirit and doing so. Some people are embalming themselves with alcoholic beverages. Some people are digging a grave with their teeth by eating junk. Knowing what this stuff does to your body, you continue to eat that which is bad. And we cut our life short because of it. Some get involved in illicit sex, ignoring all the venereal diseases that are rampant in our country today. Are you guilty? Do I need to remind you what Galatians 6, 8 says? He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. And many are doing that. Many are dying early and prematurely. They're doing things to cut their own life short. And then they want to get mad at God. It's God's fault. No. Most of it are the decisions we make. Choose life. Hey, choose life. Don't choose that which is going to cut life short. Wake up. Don't be foolish in these matters. You're disobeying this commandment when you do these things. Then finally, well, we got homicide, we got suicide, what's left? How about infanticide? Thou shalt not commit infanticide. Abortion. Let me show you what the statistics tell us today. And this may be an old statistic. But I read in America today, 4,000 babies are aborted a day. And it's legal here in good old God-blessed America. I want to tell you something. Something is wrong with a society that will protect the eggs of a bald eagle but will not protect a baby in a mother's womb. Something is wrong in that society. When we think the unborn eagle is more important than the unborn human being. Why would a mother choose death for her baby? Why would not a mother or father choose life for their unborn? Now, folks, statistics, only 1% of abortions have to do with fetal abnormalities. Only 4% have to do with the concern for the health of the mother. Well over 90% of abortions are done for reasons of convenience. They don't want the baby. It's an unwanted baby. And so they kill it. Folks, it's America's Holocaust. We're talking about America's Holocaust. Oh yeah, we look at what Hitler did in World War II and the Nazis. The Holocaust. Well, I got news for you. We've outdone Hitler. Hitler put six million to death. We have to do that yearly. Folks, the blood of the unborn is on the hands of America. And we'll answer for it. We allowed it to be legalized. We allow it to go on. And America is going to pay for it if she's not already. What do scriptures tell us about this? So oh, a preacher knows they're just arguing about when life begins. Well, I think the Bible answers that for us. Can we let the Bible speak here for a moment? Psalm 22, verse 9. Yet thou art he who didst bring me forth from the womb. Thou, it's talking to God, right? Thou didst make me trust when upon my mother's breast, upon thee I was cast from birth. Thou hast been my God from my mother's womb. They say life is in the womb. 
Psalm 51, 5 tells us the sin nature was present even within the life of the child in the womb. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. In conception, in the womb, the sin nature is already present. You might jot this verse down for later reference. Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16. I won't read that, but it reveals the tender presence of God at work in the fetus. What did God say of Jeremiah? The prophet, Jeremiah 1, 5. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. You see that? Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. God knows us in the womb. How about John the Baptist? Luke 1, 15 says of John, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. Now what's the Bible say? There's life in the womb from conception. That is life to God and God knows them. Now that pretty much settles it for me. The Bible has spoken. Finally, what science tells us? Now, you might be surprised that there is remarkable agreement between the Bible and true science as to when an individual life begins. Let me give you some facts here. A human embryo is comprised of a human sperm and a human ovum. Less than a month after conception, the unborn has its own heart. By a month and a half, it has its own lifelong brain wave. Before two months, it has all the internal organs. At 12 weeks, it has fingernails, sucks the thumb, swallows, digests, recoils from noise or pain. My friend, at no time, is it anything but a tiny, growing human being? And to kill a child in the womb is murder. It's murder. Now, if anybody here has had an abortion, I'm not trying to bash you today. I'm not trying to put you on a guilt trip. You can find forgiveness. God will forgive you. You can't change the past, but you can go on to serve God. You can choose life from this time out. I read of a young girl who became pregnant. Her fiancé was not the father. Her family was very poor. Another mouth to feed would be a hardship. Her family had a good name in the community. She didn't want to drag that name through the mud. Somebody said, an abortion is your solution. But she ended up having a baby anyway. She named him Jesus. Now many would have told Mary to get an abortion. Get an abortion. What would you advise a young person? Choose life. Always choose life. Remember Deuteronomy chapter 30? God says, I set before thee life and good, death and evil. I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. Love the Lord thy God, for he is thy life. Have you chosen life? Now you got physical life. Have you chosen spiritual life? Have you accepted Jesus Christ? Have you been born again? Born into the family of God? 
And having spiritual life, you know you've got everlasting life. Now, I've got good news for any of you here that are not saved. You can choose life today. We're going to have a hymn of invitation. Brother Sam and the musicians come. During this invitation, you can make a choice today. You can choose life. If you've never professed faith in Jesus Christ, you say, well, I believe in Him in my heart, but I've never professed Him. I want to invite you, I want to encourage you to come today and profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Now, this means more than just believing about Jesus. You can believe about Jesus and not be saved. So well, I believe he was born of a virgin. He was a child of son of God. And he was di- died on the cross. That he was resurrected. Does that save me? No. Believing about Jesus doesn't save me. How, are you believing in Jesus? Have you chosen Him to be your Lord and Savior? Is He on the throne of your heart? Have you ever professed Him publicly? Turning your back, repenting away from sin to follow Christ in the path of righteousness. Choose life. As we stand together, we're singing this hymn of invitation. We're going to invite, first of all, those of you, if you're not saved, if you've never done this, would you come, profess faith in Christ. If you need to come for baptism or church membership, if you need to come for rededication, you know you've been making some wrong choices, and today you want to change that. Whatever you need may be, as we sing, would you come? My life and let it be consecrated. Would you come? Whatever you need may be. Salvation, baptism, church membership, rededication. Just say yes to the calling of God today. Would you come? Don't let this opportunity pass by. You never know if you're going to get another. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to choose. Amen. Amen. I've never been one to drag out an invitation. Most people already made up their mind by the first verse. I've never really seen just, just dragging it on until somebody finally gives in. But you know what? The invitation is always open. And if there's anybody here, you say, Brother West, there's some things well, I'd like to talk to you about. Well, seek me out after service before you go home. If you've got any questions or if you'd like to talk with me about some decisions you're facing, I would be more than happy to visit with you before you go. Be back tonight till you got choir practice. 4.30. If you'd like to join the choir, just come ahead and be with them. Well, the Matt will be preaching tonight, our 6 o'clock service. We do have business meeting tonight. And I uh, we'll encourage you to come back and be with us for our evening service. Any final thought or announcement before we close? All right, as we bow our heads, Brother Mike Pratt, would you dismiss?